is one of the universal pictures that you should, beside that clinical reasoning is built on basic sciences, you should have this picture and post it on your bathroom window. Because when you do your conventional medical school, you're gonna start down here with your DNA. So let me build you a typical patient. Dr. Rubish did this patient, so let's see if you remember it well. And I'm gonna build a patient scenario from DNA to patient, and then watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna flip it to the patient, and you're gonna see how totally different the experience is, okay? So I'm gonna start here on chromosome 11. And on the HBB segment, I'm gonna build in a single nucleotide polymorphism. It's gonna go from a GAG codon to a GTG. Everyone know where I am? And then that's gonna change the protein. Because if you take a look at the protein, this is going to take a B globulin that looks like this. Right? And if I was gonna build into it, there's my heme structure right there. Because what I've done now is I've done a single amino acid substitution, right? I've done a hemoglobin B globulin. I've done a position six. There's the sixth amino acid on the tail. And I've substituted a glutamate to a valine. And that changes everything. Because now I've gone from a hydrophilic amino acid to a neutral amino acid. And that changes the physical chemical properties of that protein. Very nice, thick ass, right? If you've never thought about the disease this way, this is really kind of fun, isn't it? Because the physical chemical property that has changed is this. What happens to this protein if I decrease the PO2 in the blood? Because obviously this protein is in my red cell. This is hemoglobin. Okay, so when I do that hydrophilic to neutral amino acid substitution, what happens to the hemoglobin? Oh no, that's the name of the disease. But Mega, you haven't told me what happens. You haven't explained to me why this glue valve substitution right there changes everything. You've just named the disease. You haven't explained the phys pathophys, have you? Mmm, that's a little, oh, Vikas, that's absolutely wonderful, right? That's the right answer because what happens is all of these proteins can now form these long chains every time it drops. And so what that polymerization does, we can recognize it because it's going to make my cell look like this. When you see a sickle cell, you're not memorizing the shape. What you're saying is, wow, that has been distorted by polymerization due to an amino acid substitution in the sixth position. And that's not the disease, right? Is that what causes the disease? Absolutely not. That's not here nor there. The problem with that polymerization and the distortion of the red cell is it changes all of the surface proteins. And the reason we care so much about those surface proteins is it makes them sticky. So if I come down and look at a red blood cell, by being sticky, it means they stick to all of the endothelial cells. So when we say to ourselves, the defect here is now polymerization, the phrase we want in tissue, come on, Vic S, make us proud. What's the next word I'm gonna write to describe this pathophysiology? The word is? Yes, yeah, okay, that, that's a clinical outcome. What's the pathologic term, Pavithra? I'm gonna write the term here, it is vaso, occlusive. It's vaso-occlusive, okay? So the question then you have to ask yourself is, which organs have a natural decrease in their oxygen? And they all have the same feature in common. They all have sinusoids. Because remember, anytime I have a blood vessel that opens up, I decrease the flow, right? It flows slower, which means I can extract more oxygen going through the tissue. So which are my sinusoidal organs? 
Okay, so spleen, yes. Liver, yes. And what's my last organ? What's my last sign? Bone, very nice, Mega. Is bone, right? So all of these sinusoidal organs are very vulnerable to vaso occlusion, but I don't see it in the liver, right? Why don't I see it in the liver? Why do I not see that in the liver? Yeah, that's right, Vickers, right? It's got a dual blood supply, and so you can't cause ischemia. So when we talk about the two organs that are naturally damaged in sickle cell without underlying events, it is the spleen and the bone. And so what we see is bone becomes ischemic. And so when we talk about our patient, it's going to be a child with pain. So we've built this entire story from DNA to patient, and there's no gaps. And at every step of the way, you understand why it does that, right? But when we come to the step exam, we're going to start with the patient. And look how different this makes us. Because who's going to walk in the door? If we're going to write a question on this, what, what are we going to start with? We're going to start with a child with pain. So that's going to be a chief complaint, right? And now you have to say to me, how many organs can give pain? Well, pain only arises from three pathologic processes. What are the three pathologic processes that give me pain? Okay, ischemia, that's really nice. Okay, so ischemia gives me pain, yep, what else? Inflammation, really good allopathy, inflammation. And then the third thing that's going to be is something with the word neuropathic in it. So when this little kid comes in and points to his painful leg, we know perfectly well it's going to be in bone. So we can identify the bone, right? And then what we've got to decide, it's not going to be neuropathic. There's nothing there that pinches nerves. So then we've got to decide, is it? ischemia or is it inflammation? And so you can see when you do a patient-centered process, you have to find a chief complaint and from it you form a differential diagnosis. So for this patient then, we have to be able to say, is this pain in his bone from ischemia or from inflammation? So if it was ischemia, that would be sickle cell, but it's inflammation, that would be osteomyelitis. And then from there, now you can go through and explain the whole thing. And so the first fundamental way you're going to learn medicine is you've got to start with the patient, you've got to form a differential diagnosis, and then once you've identified your disease, you've got to do every step of that disease at the organ, the tissue, and the molecular level. And that's the spirit of your step exam. Clinical medicine is built on a foundation of basic medical sciences. Tell me why.